So, Jason, it was a memorial and it was a statue to Dr. Martin Luther King. You took a picture of yourself next to that statue, or had a picture made, right? Correct. Posted on Facebook. Correct. What kind of messages did you get? I got some positive messages about that, but I also got some pretty nasty comments as well. And so, I more positive than negative, um, but I did get some ugly comments made to me when I made that post on mm -hmm. social media of uh, the statue didn't look okay. And that was before you were driving back to your home down in Woodbine, and you stopped off in Irwinville? Irwinville, right. And snapped another picture. Correct. Jefferson Davis's monument, right. former that presidency is, of the uh, president. That is the capture site where the Union Army captured President Davis. Yep. There in Irwinville. Another side of history, another aspect, and you used the hashtag, deal with it. Correct. Yeah. And that started the famous thread that drew your attention. It did. So uh, Jason and I were seatmates in the General Assembly, and as seatmates, we had a lot of very intense debates, uh, disagreements, and agreements about policies, not just about the Confederate memorials, but on every end of policy. And um, I responded to his post, um, probably in the same way that I would have done if he were sitting right next to me and showed me that picture in the General Assembly. And I said, well, listen, uh, enjoy it now, because those things are coming down. And, and that was coming off of Charlotte and the discussion around the country about the appropriateness of mm -hmm. Confederate memorials. And as a result of my comment, uh, the conversation continued and it devolved into something that became a national headline. Mm -hmm. Now, I gotta say, your words on the Facebook post were pretty provocative. You really talk like that to him? I do, except for, here's the, here's the difference. Had he been standing next to me, I would have said it with a smile and a laugh, and I don't know if the conversation would have gone in the same direction had we been, uh, been in, per uh, in person. Um, it is no secret that while in the legislature, I put forth legislation to address the Confederate monuments here in Georgia, um, and I am not afraid of debate. I'm not afraid of discussion, even where we're going to disagree, even where it makes people uncomfortable, because I think that is the only way in order to address these issues is to talk about them. Um, however, I did have to consider um, the fact that, uh, you know, Jason made his own decision to respond, which I'm sure you'll talk about the response in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, would it have been different if we would have been in person? And I think it would have, frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it would have been different. What, do you, what did you type onto the Facebook post and what would you have changed about it? Uh, well, I, I'll firstly say that I do regret using the words um, in response to a provocative comment by Ms. Jones. I do regret using those words, um, but the, what the, the words that I used that got the response was, they could go missing in the Yoki Finoki. Uh, and so I think that was what really got um, the media headlines, and I think it got sensationalized, unfortunately. Um, but there is a warning in that, which means that there are bad people out there mm -hmm. that will do bad things over an issue like this. And that really was my point, because we've seen that happen in Charlottesville. So you two have a salty relationship, and you're unafraid to show your anger towards each other or at each other or frustration, but there's an understanding there that comes from sitting shoulder to shoulder in the legislature. Is that what I'm hearing? I, I wouldn't even say a saltiness or an anger. That, that wouldn't be an appropriate description. We debated policy, sometimes so angrily that we had to walk away from one another. But then we also came back and changed each other's minds on votes a lot of times, mm -hmm. on a lot of issues. Um, and sometimes we just agreed to disagree on it. Um, I gave Jason, and I say I gave because the sensitivity in many of these topics, especially race-based topics, right, would come from African Americans. And I gave Jason on the floor a safe space to be able to openly communicate what his side of a debate would say. And those conversations were very, very private, they were not repeated beyond us. And I would check him like I did on that Facebook post in private when I thought that he was really wrong. And I would give him credit when I thought that he was right on issues. So I wouldn't say salty. I would say we did exactly what we were sent there to do, which is to have real conversation to get to the type of solutions that we need. The fear of talking, the fear of being offended by things, I think is what has gotten us, in not just Jason and I, but our country in this situation now. I, I totally agree with that. I think 
you know, LaDawn and I, um, we are able to sit next to each other. We are able to talk about these things that are, that are divisive in our country. Um, if we can't do that, um, then we're falling into the trap of the PC culture. I think she's right. We as elected officials do have a duty uh, to talk about these things. We in the House of Representatives, we represent the passions of the people. And I can't think of any more passions uh, that are actually being uh, exhibited on the floor of the House than conversations between Ms. Jones and I. We have to have these conversations, whether they are uncomfortable and squeamish to look and read uh, as, mu as much as people think, but they're necessary. Um, and that's why her and I are here. Now, I will say this, you know, I think, and even in my response, I asked in the question form, was that a threat? Mm -hmm. Right. I did not think that the language was appropriate for a state representative, solely because state representatives, police officers, judges, people of power have to be more cognizant of what they say, particularly after the death of Heather Heyer, particularly in this time. Right. So I don't think it's appropriate. I won't give him a pass. But Jason and I have talked about this offline. Right? And I am settled in my heart with our conversation offline. Right? So now the issue, because it became a media thing, is for the rest of the world to understand what the problem was and then more importantly, what the solutions are. My bigger concern beyond the threat, although I addressed it, was that anybody in our country can be comfortable with knowing that there are folks that will cause physical harm over monuments. We don't cause physical harm over taxes. Not anymore, not since the Civil War. We don't threat physical harm over health care. But someone died just recently over monuments. Mm -hmm. The fact that anybody in this country will be comfortable with that bothers me. And I think that was my bigger offense as it related to Jason, that he knew it, that he said that there were people on his side of Georgia that would believe that, and that he just kind of took it as it is what it is. No, it's not what it is. We can't accept that anymore. Well, now, hang on a second. It is what it is. That was the, the South Georgia has been the scene of some of the, and, and the most violent and the most frequent uh, lynchings in the Jim Crow era, more so than any other part in the country. I mean, you can't tell them to ignore it. But it's 2017. It's not the Jim Crow era. And for us to still be comfortable with it in passing, like, oh, yeah, we just hit people with cars. It happens. That's not acceptable. We have to denounce me, that me, type me, of thing. Let me interrupt for a second. Just, I, I well, don't think let me, let you make, meant to say that you were comfortable. No, let me make something clear. I'm not comfortable with that. So if that came across that way, Ms. Jones, I do apologize to you for that. Um, but the reality is reality. Um, there are people that will do bad things over an issue like this. You have clearly seen that in Charlottesville. The KKK still marches in Nahana, Georgia. It still happens. And for me not to appropriately warn you uh, that that could potentially happen, I think would be a disservice to you, Ms. Jones. And I hear that. And, and, and because I understand that there are people out there like that, we saw them with their tiki torches not too long ago, um, I think the difference is, and I think what you're attempting to do today, what you did with your statement, was to denounce those folks. Uh, I guess my offense at the time of the conversation, or my concern is a better word, at the time of the conversation, that uh, it wasn't clear enough that you denounced it then. But you've clarified it, and that's kind of the ills of social media, Correct. right? That, that you don't get a chance, that you don't always get a chance to um, clearly say what it is that you're intending to say. So um, that's where we were. That's where we were. And that's what brought us here today. And we now have the motivation to take this unfortunate incident and turn something positive out of it. So, Jason, this is legislation. You are a legislator. Tell us what it does. Well, this is a product of our conversation. Um, the bill, it's a draft. Uh, what we've done now, we've done in section one of this bill. Um, we, want, we had decided to agree, although I think we both can live with this bill, we may not love it, but we can live with it, but that's politics. Um, first part of the bill is not to call Stone Mountain a memorial to the Confederacy, um, because from her point of view, uh, the Confederacy it stands for racism and oppression, and she does not want Stone Mountain and, uh, to, to be a memorial to the Confederacy. Obviously, I have a different view of that, but what we agreed to was language to make Stone Mountain a historical memorial uh, to Georgia's role during the Civil War era. And so with that, 
we moved into another part of the bill. Um, I'll call this, this is section three. Um, and what particularly that bill part of the section does, which I think is the meat of the bill, um, which would empower local governments to use local control. Now, I wanna say the irony here um, on this particular part of the bill is, is Jeffersonian, which is local control. And um, that is what the, really the Civil War was really fought over, hey, was the Jeffersonian let me, let me jump principle. In there. You, the, the principle is being used to accomplish what? You, you glossed over what we're actually gonna do with this. Give them local control. Give them local control to decide the following. They can do one or two things in this bill. They could decide if they wanted to remove a monument that they found offensive, that's Confederate monument, um, they can decide to move that to a, the interested private party to sell it. They could sell it or auction it, but it'd have to be to a person that has a bona fide interest in preserving that monument and that history. That's part one of what section two does. The other part of the bill is if, if a local government cannot find a, a private entity willing to conserve this monument and purchase it, then they have to move it to Stone Mountain and Stone Mountain would be serve as a repository for some of these Confederate monuments. So that, that is the meat of the bill. And the other part of the bill, lastly, essentially strengthens current language in the law that makes it unlawful to uh, deface or defame or destroy Stone Mountain. And, and Ladon, you are a former state legislator and you introduced Similar? Similar legislation. So um, to expound on what Representative Spencer said, part of the issue from those, on, from my point of view, with the Confederate monuments, particularly those on taxpayer state funded property, um, in our view, those folks are treasonous. They attempted to split our country into two. Right? We do not need to continue to uplift them as if splitting our country is a positive thing. However, it is a part of history, and you can't erase history. But by changing the Stone Mountain Park from a memorial to the Confederacy, which many people may know was a compromise when we changed the Georgia flag to take the Confederate symbol off the Georgia flag, they then protected Stone Mountain as this Confederate park. Well. We don't need a Confederate park in Georgia. What we do need is a historical park that talks about all of the Civil War. This will allow us to expand the history there. It will allow us to discuss the contributions of not just the Confederate uh, War or Confederate Army soldiers, but the African Americans who were free and enslaved that contributed, to the women who contributed, to the Native Americans who contributed to the, during the Civil War era. I believe that when that history, not erased, but put into full context, is given to the state, it makes it better. We know in DeKalb County, they were just at the county commission meeting talking about removing uh, the Confederate memorial on their town square. This is what this will allow it to do. It automatically creates a moment for each city, each county to have this discussion. They can listen to their citizens, and if they decide that these things need to come down, we don't have to erase history, but we can put it in its proper context in the memorial. And then there were some things that we didn't agree on that I, I would like to talk about related sure. to this bill. I mean, this was not just, um, hey, we both are kumbaya and let's move on. For me, the Confederate flags that still fly at the bottom of Stone Mountain are a problem. They need to be removed, right? But I also understand that politics, real politics, not Trumpian politics, is about compromise. Mm -hmm. And in order to compromise, I was satisfied with expanding the purpose of the park and allowing, giving the room for the Stone Mountain Memorial Association, who decides what goes in and out the park, to have the authority to make those changes without going through the legislature. Okay. And I'm fine with putting that in their pocket. If it were up to me, I would have it pulled down. But I also recognize that there are people who are afraid of the side of the mountain being sandblasted. We know that there were some politicians recently, gubernatorial candidates who wanted to get some political fame by making that claim. Well, that's ridiculous. It's a waste of taxpayer dollars. It does not solve the issue, and it's more divisive. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think Jason has some requests that I simply could not agree with. He made it so that he wanted so that nothing else could be added to the carving. I couldn't go for that. Right? And so in as much as I compromised on directly calling out the flag, he compromised on how we address the carving. At the end of the day, this is a middle ground, to tr a starting point 
um, for the legislature who may change this bill completely. They may ignore it. They may not want to address it. Um, but for them to have real conversation that starts from a place of agreement rather than starting from a place of division. One of the things that I brought to the table that I wanted to, to discuss, which you know her and I didn't agree on, um, I think a really sincere solution to this issue is to privatize Stone Mountain. Um, I know that that may ruffle feathers on both sides of the aisle, but I really feel like if, if gov I believe government shouldn't tell you what to think or feel. That's, that's sort of where I come from in terms of a, of a principle. And, and if we're really concerned about those things, if we're concerned about what Confederate monuments mean, what symbols mean, then let's privatize Stone Mountain and give it to people, sell it to people who actually have a bona fide interest and making sure that that part of history, that part of the Southern tradition, which is good, the part of it is actually preserved. And so while I, that's how we came to this, this idea of local control and moving unwanted monuments um, to Stone Mountain and use Stone Mountain as a repository for them. And I couldn't agree to the privatization because there's a broader history, right? After you finished the Civil War, where Stone Mountain at a time was used as a, re a reforming portion for the Ku Klux Klan, right? And that history alone, and on top of the fact that we then changed the flag and made this a compromise, gives them a safe haven of a sort of place. Right, in order to um, to uplift, and so privatization for me um, was a was a problem, and, and I thought that it, it continued to um, expound on the white supremacist notion. Not talking about Jason, but in general, those white supremacists who want to say, "See, we run this. Look at our protected areas. Those protections need to go away." In the same way, the thought process of we want to kill people over these monuments need to go away. And so mm -hmm. privatization was something that I couldn't agree to. Um, luckily, it was not um, a deal breaker in general for, uh, for this discussion. So we found sort of a middle ground. We give local authorities the option when their citizens petition and get angry about a particular monument or offended by a particular monument, they got a couple of options as to what to do with it. Stone Mountain is going to stay basically the same as it is for the time being. Nobody's going to sandblast it. Nobody's going to sandblast <laughs> the mountain, but hopefully they will expand. And quickly. we're doing something that nowhere else in the country is being done. This is a, a, we're trying to create a process mm -hmm. for, if not resolving this issue, then at least having the discussion. Yes, that's correct. That, that right? I agree, and I think if we can't, if we can't have a discussion like this. Um, then each side is going to go to their respective corners and dig in, and it's not going to be helpful. I know there are going to be critics who say, you took it too easy on Jason. You should have continued to call for his resignation. You should want him to get out, and maybe, but then what? Then someone else comes in his place and we still have monuments around the state and people dying over them? I don't think that that's worth it. Um, uh, the, and, and then also just thinking of the technicality of it. He would only, he's the only person that can decide if he resigns. It will be up to the citizens of Georgia, to the people who elect him to decide if this, if this movement is enough to say that he's done what he's need to do. They may decide it is, they may decide it's not. That's up to them. Even those people who call for his resignation and call for the GBI to step in and do an investigation, I will not tell them not to do that. In fact, I encourage citizens to speak up for what it is that they think is, is appropriate. Mm -hmm. However, I could not continue to sleep well at night knowing that I was a part in any way of something that was divisive for our entire country. So I rather humble myself and accept the fact that I may be considered going too light on him mm -hmm. in an effort to help our state progress further. That was more important to me. You're not going to win any popularity contests with this bill, are you? Well, there will be, there will be others on my side that will look at this as uh, capitulation. Uh, but I would, I would send a message to the folks on, on my side of the fence, which is, in politics, if you're not at the table for the discussion, you're going to be on the menu. And I believe it's time that we come forward and propose a, a viable solution because the truth of the matter is if we're not at the table giving our two cents worth on this issue, um, we will have no say so at all. And so um, I think that's the Jeffersonian tradition. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that is the true thing of what the Southern tradition is about, is, is speak up. 
I remember being in the General Assembly, and every time you have visitors come down, particularly if they work with the state, we all stand up and clap for them. And I remember the Speaker of the House saying, we would like to welcome all of the state appointed, I don't know if that's the right term, officers for the state of Georgia. And I stood next to Jason, I looked up and I said, what do you recognize about that? He's like, what? I, I don't know. I said, they're all white men. <laughs> Not a single one of them brought any diversity of thought from a woman, from an African-American, from a native, someone other than white men. If I am not willing to have this conversation with Jason, he would have never noticed that. Now, will it change his mind about whether or not that's appropriate? I don't know. <laughs> but I bet you he will never stand up and look up there and see all white men and not remember me telling him and reminding him that we have a duty to make sure everybody's voices are heard in all parts of the state. That's why we're having this conversation, despite what the critics may say about it. It's important. Good. And I, I remember that conversation um, because uh, she's right. I mean, there are things that I don't have a perspective of, and her likewise. There's a thing that she doesn't have a perspective of. And so it's these conversations, unfortunately, um, got on social media and was sensationalized and unfortunately twisted in a way, uh, I think negatively where her and I did not want it to go. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, unfortunately, I, I, my, my criticism of the media is they, they appear to not have anything better else to do these days, <laughs> well, um, well, but get folks let's into trouble. That. Let's address that then, because we are on Facebook Live and we've got media here covering this event. Why was it important, LaDawn, to do this live? My biggest concern out of all of this is not the bill being passed. Um, my biggest concern is that the media around the country will be more concerned about the fight we had than concerned about the solutions that we're trying to bring. Because when we look at the media now, it seems like, I get it, they're there for ratings, right? They have to make money. Um, but at the same time, I think that they have the power, um, the constitutional protection, and the authority to make sure that they are promoting these positive things equally as much as the negative things, right? You know, on one end, I really wished uh, our, our somewhat private, it was on Facebook, so it could only be so private, but our private conversation had not been blown up. On the other side, I recognized that had it not, we would not be sitting here right now with this proposed legislation. And so, you know, six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. I, I, I just hope that the media will be as open and the media will be as willing to ex show, make us an example mm -hmm. around the country, not just in Georgia. This is how we need to solve these issues. Let's stop talking about people kneeling and Kaepernick and let's talk about what the policy issue is. That's why we're here and the media can help us do that. They have a responsibility to help us do right. that. I would say, um, I think it's media malpractice to do what was done. I believe uh, when you sensationalize something like this, you create more division in this country. Although LaDonna and I do have that responsibility, uh, we, do, we are held at a higher standard. She's an officer of the court, I'm a state representative. We do have a higher standard. However, we are people, we are human, we have these same intense discussions like everybody else does at the water cooler. And so I would just say to the media, you have a immense, responsibility to get a message out like this that we're talking out today and do it justice. Um, I just, in closing remarks, you know, I am um, unapologetically American. I love this country. I love the opportunities that have been afforded to me. I am a first generation college graduate, first generation law student, um, and we were able to do those things because um, of the opportunities our country has afforded us. But it is not lost on me that there are many in our country who are still suffering, who are still being mistreated. We have progressed since the Civil War, we have progressed since civil rights, but we have not gotten far enough. And I would really just hope that right now, while we're watching what's going on in the world, just the energy is so negative that we really all have a duty to do better. I will personally do better when I communicate on social media or otherwise, um, but I also will not run away from debates and discussions. When I proposed the bill a couple of years ago, I sat down with the president of the Sons of the Confederate Veterans for a three hour long meeting. Neither one of us left with a 
strongly different mindset than what we came in, but we taught each other things. And I know everyone is not able to have those conversations and then walk away, but I learned something from that conversation. What I want America to do is learn something about the other side. You can disagree, but then take a step back, come back to the seat like Jason and I had too many times when we disagreed, and find what can be a solution. That's all I really want, and I could not rest um, with this, we could have just been quiet mm -hmm. and let this just disappear into the 24 hour news cycle and just let it go away. But my heart was not comfortable with mm -hmm. even the five minutes that I had being involved in the division of our country. And I just hope now that the legislature, that the governor, that the supporters on either side will not let this just go away as a conversation, but really make it as a step forward to creating positive stuff for Georgia. Well, I would say that, um you know, this has uh, gotten the focus of, you know, what does the Confederacy mean? What, is, what does this mean in the Southern tradition? Um, I would just tell people, everything about the South is not evil. Everything about the South is not about racism. Everything about the South is not about oppression, although that is part of our history. But also, let's look and see what's good about the Southern tradition, which is Jeffersonianism, which is local control, which is representative government which means that each state in this federal government has a voice and should have a voice at the table. I think that's what, get, what, get, what gets missed in this conversation is the proper historical context of the Confederacy and what role it played in American history. There's too many slogans out there. I think we as Americans tend to get intellectually lazy and just accept the bumper sticker slogans about what happened in 1861 to 1865. We have a responsibility to learn our history because if we do not, we will repeat the bad parts of our history. That's why I came to the table with LaDawn. I wanted to make sure that what is good and true about the Southern tradition does get put out there, but we also have to confront what was not good about it. And so that's why I came to the table.